Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Tuesday, October 8th. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you on this episode. We have four division series all knotted up at one game apiece. If you think, hey, has that ever happened before? The answer is no, it yeah, has but, not. Yeah. How many years have we had this system? <laughs> hey, it's never happened before. Remember when the StatCast was new and everyone said, this is the first time this has happened in the StatCast era. This isn't <laughs> yeah, right. nearly as bad as that was. Not even close. <laughs> yeah, well, my, uh, my 10-year-old turned 10 yesterday, so it's the first time he's doing everything as a 10-year-old. <laughs> so he has not lived any day of his life without StatCast at his disposal. Because StatCast <laughs> turned 10 earlier this year, we baked the cake. Well, actually, AI baked the cake and we are apologizing and planting trees at some yeah. point this off season, but nevertheless, we've got a good show lined up. Lots to cover a couple of game threes today, a couple of game threes coming up on Wednesday. So we're going to start today focusing on the two series that are happening Tuesday before we look back at what happened Monday. And then tomorrow we'll preview more preview more of the AL matchups on the Wednesday morning show F- full four games. Finally get four games back on the calendar on Wednesday, so I'm excited for that. But let's start with this mets Philly series. The matchup is Sean Manaya versus Aaron Nola as that series moves back to New York. Here's a silly stat for you. Aaron Nola has the same career ERA in the regular season that he does in the playoffs, right? The playoffs are supposed to be harder. But 370 in the regular season, 370 in the playoffs. I think the interesting thing here, both sides should be pretty close to full strength in their bullpen. I saw... Tim Britton had a piece suggesting that maybe David Peterson and Tyler McGill are held back for the Mets because they might want them available in game four just to give those guys a little extra rest. But this is going to come down to a couple of things. And one in particular is the effectiveness of Sean Mania. You've talked about how he has changed his arm slot over the course of the season. It continues to drop, but he's become a lot more effective with that lower slot. So, it's a familiar face in the sense that the Phillies did see Sean Manaya three times in the regular season, but each time they see him, he's a little bit different than the last time just because of that arm slot. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the trick that he pulled that's uh, so interesting is that he dropped his arm slot, but he kept the amount of ride that he had. Um, which is kind of like adding see. ride though, right? Can can you can you like kind of elaborate on that? Like if you if you do that, it's like adding it's the same effect as adding ride, is it not? It really is because if you look at at a chart you know, that, that compares release point to ride, um what ends up happening is if you have a little bit more ride than people expect given your arm slot, as the arm slot goes down, the amount of ride that you need to have to be kind of unexpected and to have good ride goes down, you know? Because you just need to have more ride than people expect. So by kind of hopping along, you know, down towards the submariners with his release point, but keeping his ride where it was before, yes, exactly. As you said, it's the it's akin to adding more ride. And it has made his fastball more effective. And I think it's just that now he's a little bit more like you see Chris Sale coming out of there and uh and it's a little bit, you know, on the same level of like a hater or sale where you kind of see that arm slot and you expect it to do different things. And then, and it's not even that you expect to do different things, you know, with that verbal part of your brain where you can be like, I think this ball is going to do this. It's more that the kind of constructs in your brain, the chunking that happens is that you kind of, your brain creates these programs and sees certain slots and it creates a program for that movement. And um, Shaman is offsetting that. What I what I do wonder is, you know, the Phillies have seen him as recently as September 21st. So this is post slot change. Um, and when they saw him in June, they, you know, hung six runs and three and two thirds on him. When they saw him in September with the new slot, uh, he pitched seven innings, gave up three and struck out six against zero walks. So, you know. You'd think, oh well, the new slot is everything, and so Phillies are are going to have a harder time with him. But then now they've gotten used to it. Maybe they've readjusted that that sort of brain program, and they're like, no, no, no. I know it used to be like this, but we just saw him, and it was like this, you know. Um, and in the meantime, Manai has never really had a great secondary, and the slider and the changeup do not rate well against um, 
uh, by stuff plus or, or any of those metrics what he has been doing is making it really hard on hitters by throwing the high four seam all the time and then throwing a high slider that just dips below where the four seam would be but if you could somehow identify the slider coming out of his hand that's basically a, a middle middle pitch that he throws uh at 80 miles an hour so if you can identify the slider hit the slider uh just easier said than done this year uh since the slot change uh shamanaya has thrown 148 sliders and no right-hander has hit an extra base hit off him off that slider it's just when you look at the heat map you're like dudes he's throwing the slider middle middle and it's 80 miles an hour like can you do something on that so i wonder if the arm slot actually is more deceptive even for the slider if if you think about it if it has any sort of hump or any sort of you know weird movement profile like if they're if it's down here then maybe maybe that covers it up more maybe it's harder to tell fastball from slider at that release point yeah i mean it would certainly explain how you could get away throwing it where he's been throwing it if uh if you just can't really pick much up out of the hand now uh, this is interesting from the other side, too, because the Mets have seen plenty of Aaron Nola. They saw him twice in the regular season. In <laughs> one of those starts, Nola threw a complete game shutout. That was at City Field back on May 14th. More recently, on September 13th, it was a blowout win for the Mets in which Nola gave up six runs on six hits in four and a third innings. So uh, complete you know, mixed bag in those two performances. Uncharacteristically, Aaron Nolan, Aaron Nola had some uh, command issues, I think, a little bit in that last outing against the Mets. But, you know, familiar faces for sure. What do you think the Mets game plan is against Nola this time around? Yeah, interestingly enough, in the first time through against the Mets, uh, he threw twice as many cutters, uh, uh, you know, by rate. Um, and early in the season, he was a little bit in love with his cutter. Um, and that really sort of fell off in the second half. So, uh, I do wonder about the use of the cutter. Um, I, it does give him three fastball looks to throw at, at people. And it does keep him from pushing that knuckle curve anywhere closer to 50% late in the season. He's been throwing the knuckle curve 40% of the time. Um, and it's a really good pitch and, and maybe people couldn't even hit it if they sat on it, but the closer that gets to 50 or whatever, you get the Pierce Johnson effect. So I do think that the cutter, um, is somewhat, somewhat important to him and, and maybe he just needs to have a touch and feel. And that's, that was the difference. You mentioned the a command difference in the, in the two games. So this, this is an interesting game because you've got two pitchers that are really good pitchers and yet this could be, a, a a large run scoring game. Yeah. Yeah, definitely could be. It feels like these are two lineups that are ready to erupt again at some point. Curious to see if it actually is tonight. Part of the reason I believe that is that with the Phillies and how they can match up against Benaya, they can nearly run out a full starting nine of hitters who were above average by WRC plus against lefties this season. I think their strength as a lineup can be stacking a bunch of righties, even having a guy like Kyle Schwarber, who's been better lefty on lefty over the course of his career and still at least hits for power against lefties. That sort of stacks up and, and makes this, I think, a really tough assignment for Manaya. So I do think the pitching edge goes still in the favor of the Phillies, even if it's only by a small margin and, with the adjustments Manaya has been making. An important game for Alec Baum. Yep, it's going to be back uh, in that starting lineup after sitting for Edmundo Sosa, Edmundo Sosa in game two. Yeah, and 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 set up now righty versus lefty, you know, in his wheelhouse. That it would be a good time for him to have a good game. Any changes to your initial prediction for the series with uh, the Mets picking up home field advantage for these final three? No, I mean, I I picked the Mets on vibes, and the vibes are still pretty pretty strong. Although I would say that uh, they took a little bit of a, a of a ding. Um, with that second that second game, um, losing in the bullpen too, uh, you know, vibes can only get you so far. You need to have a closer that's there for you, and 
Edwin Diaz needs to find whatever he's missing. What I think he's missing is fastball command. I don't know if you can find it quickly, but we do know that it isn't one of those things that's very sticky. So maybe that just means he can wake up tomorrow, feel better, you know, feel more confident, throw the, throw the fastball more towards the middle of the zone and, and not worry about things. Who knows? You never know. Yeah, location uh, for for a lot of closers has been not perfect at times where it has needed to be so oh, far. Man, I mean, in this, this postseason. postseason, we've seen Diaz, Hader, Classe, you know, like Devin, Devin Williams. Williams. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, Classe gave up a homer. He's given up a homer and that cutter three times in his career. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the 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 way class a this was a slider so he's been he's given up two homers on sliders prior to the one carry carpenter hit that's, that's on 1340 sliders regular season postseason combined number 1341 ended up in the bleachers which sorry is, i'm jumping ahead but it is it is uh it is related because we were talking about excellent relievers that you know maybe someone is listening and thinks oh well you know the Phillies were supposed to have excellent pen. What's going on with that? You know, it's like, I don't know, dude. It's, you know, Jeff Boffman, I still think is a good pitcher. You know, <laughs> like, it's, it, it just all, all the regular season numbers get tossed out the window at some point in October. It feels like it's uh, one thing I do. Weird. I do think is somewhat supported by the numbers is this idea that the more often you see a shape, the better you get at it. So the more often you see a divisional opponent, the better you are theoretically against all the different shapes they can throw at you. Mm. I mean, just imagine having not seen Shamanaya at all before or after the arm slot change versus having seen Shamanaya both before and after the arm slot change in the recent months, you know? And I think about this a little bit when it comes to, you know, the different... Uh, matchups we have like i don't think angel zerp is that great of a reliever you know but he's pitching well and i think that some people aren't just are just not that accompanied uh, aren't are, are that used to it i haven't seen his particular brand of stuff you know would would he be throwing up zeros against the guardians who've seen him a lot more you know and Think of somebody like Tyler Holton, you know, opening that game against the Guardians and just getting whooped. It's like, well, they saw a lot of him. And some of the research on the effectiveness of openness strategies and how relievers are are used and how they uh, how how they find success is based on how relievers are used and find success globally because you want to use global stats to, because that's a better idea. You don't want to be like BVP like oh Tyler Holton you know, these guys are one for six against him. You know, that doesn't make any sense. So then you break it out and be like, oh, openers do this and that's great. Yes, but this is still Tyler Holton who the, you know, the 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 Guardians have seen a bunch, you know? So I wonder if some of these strategies are smarter and more savvy during the season when the Brewers are in town and you're the Rays and you're like, oh, you haven't seen my opener, you know? Whereas, the, you know, if you kind of throw the opener against the Yankees over and over again, like like the Rays might, then maybe the strategy wouldn't look as good. Yeah, it gets an interesting point, and it could be the thing that causes this game to be higher scoring than expected. Both of these games that we're going to have today, because you've got division rivals going toe-to-toe -to -toe in both of them. I think one of the key differences for me as I look at these two teams, though, look at these two series, though, is that the Padres made some in-season adjustments, right? They added a few fresh faces. The Dodgers did, too, with Michael Kopech being the big addition. So I wonder if the trade deadline relievers, aside from giving you more depth, also give you a little extra boost if you run into a team that you've seen a lot of, because at least then you have one more high-quality reliever that the opposing hitters have not seen as much, especially if they brought that player over from the other league where they were maybe going to see them once in interleague if that yeah there's some there's some talk that like you know jeremiah strata comes out of the out of the season just blowing the the doors off the, the league and yeah for the first 16 innings he had an era under one and it was amazing june the era is seven august the era is six um maybe those are times when he starts seeing divisional opponents a second and third time you know there's there's i think there is more research to be used in the idea of decay which is decay is the idea that the more often we see a shape the better we get at it you know 
Um, and that could be something that could be really inf important for you know divisional opponents and, and and for thinking about how many times you want to use a reliever against a certain opponent and stuff like that so um yeah tanner scott brian hoeing you know even a guy like sean reynolds who you know is a converted position player not many people have seen him mm -hmm. you know it's kind of fun to have you know that one arm you'd be like well this guy throws really hard and nobody he has no command but nobody's seen him and what if he can just you know throw it down the middle a few times and they can't figure it out so let's head to san diego talk about dodgers padres game three where i think walker bueller being the starter for the dodgers probably puts them in the underdog or at least the uh, more difficult spot as far as how are you going to get 27 outs in this matchup you discussed the you know bueller and the importance of his curveball a little bit on monday's show and i was starting to look at what else he's got in the arsenal right now the other thing that stood out to me is that the cutters become really important for him because his four seamer has been getting hammered. It was getting hammered before the second Tommy John surgery in 2022. Opposing hitters are slugging 696 against Bueller's four seamer this season. So hiding that pitch as much as possible seems like part of the how do you work through what you've got right now if you're Walker Bueller. And he did see the Padres in his final regular season start. He went five, only gave up one run. Only had three swinging strikes, so it wasn't exactly a dominant performance. Even though by results it was, you know, good enough. If, if they, if the Dodgers could sign up for that in Game Three, they would just take that and and be very happy with it. But this is one of those situations where decay and, and saying like, okay, this game plan worked just a few weeks ago. Would this game plan work twice against a Padres lineup that's so good at tempering whiffs, but also is so good at doing damage? Yeah, I wish, you know, I wish upon him, you know, a slider that worked. The the slider this year has allowed a 537 slugging, and that's why you've seen him kind of go away from that. Um, the cutter has decent numbers. It's a pretty good pitch, 232, 343 slugging. For a pitch that you use as a fastball, that's good. Yeah, the four seam bad slugging, and so that's why he's had to kind of play the cutter off of it, and so that also puts a lot of pressure on the curve because the slider's no good, the change is no good, uh, and the cutter needs to be used as a fastball. So you can't you can't get the same mileage out of the cutter if you're using it as a fastball and a breaking ball, um, and so the curve has been super important for him. In the games where he's going well, he usually has pretty good command of the curveball. But he's also allowed a 480 slugging on the curveball this year. So there are times when he commands the curveball well. There are times when he bounces the curveball in front of the plate. And there are times when he hangs the curveball. And I have no idea which one of those this will be um, before, uh, before the game. But I think with every curveball that I see him bounce um, in the game tonight, the quicker I am to take him out of the game. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And in the Padres have enough in that bull or the Dodgers have enough in that bullpen to be quick with the hook. I mean, both of these teams have depth. We like the Padres depth a little bit more. I think we trust a few more of their guys if the game is on the line. But there are ways to work around this. I think what happens, though, if you go to the bullpen really early in game three, it might be more difficult to navigate everything in game four. If you're the Dodgers, that's where it might start you know, to cost you something. Like if you use Landon Knack in game three, I don't know who you're starting in game four. Then you're probably doing more of a Johnny Holstaff sort of approach to four, which the Dodgers have done in recent postseasons. It, it can, Is game it can four work. tomorrow? Yes, they have back-to-back back this time. And, but then there's a rest day. There's a travel five. day, yes. Yeah. And you go back to Yamamoto for game five, well, most likely. It could work. We've seen some bullpen games work. We've also seen it not work, and... I would have, I would assume that the bullpen is going to be used to some extent tonight, no matter what. So if you're doing Johnny Holstaff tomorrow, then they've all been used the day before. Right. And that's the less ideal Johnny Holstaff approach. You'd rather do that coming off of the off day if you have to, as opposed to doing it on a back to back with a few of the key pieces you would need to get through it, but not impossible. I mean, just they, one want, of those they want to also keep Landon Ack just to have somebody with some depth so they can at least have somebody maybe go two or three tomorrow. Yeah. So I mean, the that's Dodgers... why people start saying that the Padres, you know, have turned this and that the Dodgers have to fight for something. But 
the other flip side of this is Michael King has to get through that lineup, you know, and he has to do it at least twice. And if he can get through it three times, then they're really set up. But if he can, get, you know, he has to get through that lineup twice. And that means Otani twice, you know. And I know Mookie's been struggling, but Mookie's not an easy out. You know, the one thing that he has been struggling on where Michael King really lines up well against him is that um, Mookie hasn't been hitting sweepers well. And if you can put the sweeper in the zone or out of the zone. He's been trying to work on not chasing, and that's the easier part of Mookie because he's got a great eye. But you can still throw the sweeper in the zone, and he won't do that much with it. And so, uh, you know, the the if you can neutralize Mookie, then you're then you're really most worried about Otani and maybe Teoscar. And Teoscar is a right-hander, so Michael King is, you know, death to right-handers with the sinker and the sweeper. Um and, and, and a big part of that is, is you know, you, there's there's a pitching ninja overlay that really gets us across is that the, they come out so similar, but the sinker and sweeper are so horizontally different. I mean, we're talking 24 inches of difference, two feet of movement difference. <laughs> so you see these pitches coming in. That's why you'll see a sword. That's why you'll see somebody swing at some pitch that looks like it was never a strike and was never going to be a strike is because they thought that was a sinker, you know? And, uh, and so... That's why he's going to be death to righties. So it's really you circle Otani's name three or four times, and uh, maybe Muncy, you know, will give him a good at bat. Um, Lux could could do something, but I I kind of I'm more afraid of Lux on the level of like singles and walks, you know. Sure. Yeah. You know, so you just don't want to, you just don't want to string together a, a Lux single or a walk with a Otani homer or a Max Muncy homer. That's that's where you get worried. Freeman. Bit of a wild card with that ankle. We just we just don't know how healthy he is, how much power he's going to get off that ankle. But um, you know, you get a really good at bat there too. So that's those are the names that Michael King is most worried about today. Yeah, the lefties. If Freeman can't go, that is a, a bigger loss against Michael King than it is against some of the other starters because of the dependence on that sweeper. One last thought on Mookie Betts. You know, I, I know sometimes we have narratives that develop around players in the postseason and they're not entirely true uh, we've talked about you know josh Hader having a couple of bad blowups which is true but his overall results in the postseason when you look at the full scope are actually very good mookie betts actually has struggled in the playoffs he's been in the playoffs eight times now going back to his days in boston so it's a 245 333 367 line and it's up to 273 plate appearances now Mookie Betts is like two great series away from fixing that. And any day could be the day where it all starts to click for him. And it's one of the more surprising developments for me because the type of hitter that Mookie Betts is, being a low strikeout guy, being a really tough at bat all the time, would seemingly lend itself to avoiding a prolonged stretch of struggles, even in the playoffs, because he's just that good of a player. So it's it's one of the weirder position player lines I think I've seen for someone who by any other measure looks like an easy eventual hall of fame bat. Yeah. And you know, I wonder if there's a comfort thing that when you look at his postseason lines, the weird thing is when you say like, Oh, he has 273 play since in the postseason seems like a lot, but it's a collection of little bits, you know? <laughs> um, and if you look at the the one where he had the most sample in the postseason was that 2020 championship run where he got 82 plate appearances, hit 296, 378, 493, and it looked just fine, thank you very much, you know? Um, and the time that he, you know, the, looked the worst um, was, you know, the 2023 postseason when he had 12 plate appearances and didn't get a hit and had like a walk. You know, so um, it's kind of hard to to say that it's, oh, it's 273 player appearances and therefore tells us a lot. It's really 273 player appearances divided by eight different, nine different appearances in the minor, in the in the postseason. You know, so. Well, yeah. And, and in 2020 was strange because there were, you know, few fans in, in the stands. And, and I think it was less travel than a typical postseason too, because games were only played in a handful of locations. Like I think one thing we underestimate about the playoffs, even with the tighter schedule is like the off days are not really like traditional off days. They're travel days and you travel more often within the series 
in the playoffs than you do in the regular season. Mm -hmm. That might have a negative impact on certain players or most players because it's not it's not easy to be resting less with higher adrenaline, higher stakes during the games and and to not be in that routine quite the same way. So I'm not saying that's necessarily the case with bet specifically, but I think it's something that happens in playoff baseball that might help to explain why players who are phenomenal for 162 just have completely different outcomes in these tiny samples. Yeah, I also posited that there might be an interesting home away split trend in that um, if there's better technology available to the hitters and, and, and different kind of training methods that they can do at home that might not be available on the road, that you might find um, some inherent hitter splits uh, home and array that have m nothing to do with necessarily cheating or sign stealing or anything and more to do with oh well at home I have a traject you know I have this I have that we, you know my guys throw me short box and you know like they they were talking about the Arizona Arizona has a traject but they have to set it up closer to the plate um, than other trajects because they don't have space in hmm. the Arizona you know stadium to like they don't actually have a place where they can put it at 57 feet or whatever so it has hmm. to be at 54 feet for them so whenever an arizonian used the traject at home it's even closer than usual so it's like um you know there's these weird quirks that you know i think data and tech could actually sort of push into hyperspace a little bit and create some some real differences between home and away for you know training for hitters but um yeah I, this is all conjecture but I would assume that he's fine. The biggest difference that you find with Mookie Betts is not in the strikeout rate or the walk rate, um, you know, between the postseason and the regular season. It's power. And power is just one of those things that's, um, you know, noisiest in small samples. And even a 273 plate appearance sample that, you know, might give you some idea of how much power he had. Like if he played half a season and had a 122 ISO, you'd be like, whoa, what's going on with Mookie Betts, right? Except it's not a half season again. It's just these little drips and little, drops. Yeah, a couple of weeks here, a couple of weeks there. I mean, it, it's, and it's not easy. It's postseason baseball, right? right? The opposing teams are good. They get the matchups they want as often as they want them. That adds to it oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah, think of how many relievers, so many relievers Mookie Betts sees. Yeah, uh, it's it's strange though. Like the, whatever the explanation is, it's just one of those strange things about postseason. Do we have to talk baseball. about all the other stuff. I mean, it's you know, it's what I I don't want to like be like oh both sides. I mean, if you are Jerks and Profar and you are gonna do a little dance and and Hector the fans, like it can't be like oh my god, I can't believe they they threw something at me and like afterwards too. Which I to his I don't necessarily think that profile has been like oh my god like I, i'm fainting i'm give me my fainting couch they're throwing stuff at me um but you know there is some some push and pull there um and uh but it's never appropriate for a fan to throw anything at a player particularly because there's no expectation now you flip that and you say okay well could Fernando Tatis, Tatis have expect? Was there a reason for Fernando Tatis to expect Jack Flaherty to throw at him? Yes, because Jack Flaherty is throwing the pitch in his general direction generally, <laughs> you know, because like, he's expecting the pitcher to throw a pitch to him. At least he's looking at him and, and and knows the ball's coming, right? Oh, so when Manny Machado throws a ball at the Dodgers dugout, they're not expecting a ball to be thrown at them. So is that more like the fans throwing the ball? Except that Manny Machado threw the ball on the ground and it bounced three times before it got to the dugout. So it's not really like he was trying to hit somebody. Like, did he throw it a little bit harder than usual when Manny Machado threw the ball to the dugout, uh, to the Dodgers dugout? Maybe. But did he hit anybody? You know, like, I don't know. There's all this, like... That's why I said I don't want to be like oh both sides are to blame, but like I don't I don't really want to take the side that like here are the bad guys and here are the good guys, you know what I mean? Sure. There's just there's just kind of like you know they're human beings, and I think Manny was frustrated 
you know, frustrated that he struck out to Flaherty and got yelled at by Flaherty and then Flaherty throws at Tatis, you know, like that's, that might be a little frustrated. And so a normal, normally you throw the ball to the dugout. I think he was just like, you know, yeah, I think he threw a little bit harder than usual. That's yeah. what I think he did. Maybe his way of saying that was BS. I right. didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. But he didn't hit anybody. And like, if he really wanted to hit somebody, he could have. And like, imagine how different it would be if Manny Machado reared up and threw a ball and hit Dave Roberts. Yeah. I mean, Manny Machado's season would be over with some kind of lengthy suspension, right? Like, they're, they're, that really, I don't think he would do that. That seems pretty stupid. I don't think so. he did, I don't think that's what his intent was. So I don't know. Tatis is dancing in the outfield. Profar is dancing in the outfield, and they're engaging the 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 fans that way. Do they deserve to be you know have stuff thrown at them? No, no. And like there's 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 to... two pretty simple lines that continue to get crossed in this postseason, right? I mean, the throwing stuff on the field I think has only been isolated to that Dodgers Padres game a couple nights ago. But players who are involved in bad moments getting harassed on Twitter continues to be a problem, right? Like it's just off the charts bad. There's never an excuse, never an explanation, never a justification to do that. And yet it continues to happen. Threats being made to players themselves or to their families. It's just out of control. Venmo requests. Have you heard of this? This is like a new thing. Venmo requests. People are sending Venmo requests to players because they lost their bets and being like, you know, give me the $5,000 I lost because you didn't hit a home or whatever. Yeah, figure that one out for yourselves. Grow up. Easy enough. The, but I mean, uh, it is interesting when you. I, I I I don't know if it is. I, there is a clear line. Not you know. It's not like as much as um, Tatis is you know, when he's doing his. Like I don't know if you've seen the video, but he's doing this kind of like you know swinging his thing sure. around, kind of dance at the at the outfield, and you know. Obviously, Profar is engaged in verbal and, you know, sort of physical kind of gestures at each other with the in the outfield. And um, and then you have, uh, you know, Michael Garcia, um, you know, retweeting uh, Carlos Rodon, was it? Like, don't celebrate. Oh, cel- yeah, I was celebrating K's really in the game. Sure. Which, again, is part of the game. That That's part of the game. I don't have a problem with that. Like if, if you celebrate those K's early and you give up some runs and you end up taking the L, then that's on you later. Like that's I wonder just the if way the, it is. I wonder if the real problem is alcohol. Like, like honestly, like you know, the players aren't drunk and they're doing their thing, they're having fun, and then some drunk guy is like, "Screw you!" and like throws stuff at him. You know, if if the worst thing that somebody in the bleachers said to Jerks and Profar was "Screw you," I think the vibe would be pretty different. Like no, that, I, that'd I, be I, that'd be a little better. I did definitely. And I wasn't saying that's exactly what said. No, I know, but like that's that's part of it too, right? I think part of what turns you into an on-field, let's call it a villain, someone who's going to kind of interact back with the fans and taunt the fans back is because people say horrific things to you. Mm. So if you are going to try and brush that off in some way, like taunting back, gesturing back is probably relatively mild in most instances, right? I mean, yeah. it's just... Some of this is part of the game. And it is victim blaming to get too, you know, in like to talk too much about what Profar is doing when somebody's throwing stuff at him because Profar didn't throw anything at anybody, you know? Right. So anyway, it, it just, the like, rivalries are great. The intensity is great, but let's, let's find like the healthier line and not have people throwing stuff on the field. That would be great. Let's not harass players and their families. And let's not, I think on the other side, like let's not make, you know, Manny and Profar into like more villainy villains than they are or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't have to be this next level sort of thing. There's been plenty of great stuff happening on the field. I mean, there's a couple of things that kind of overlap what I saw on Monday and something the Padres actually might do in their series in game four, right? So the Padres have talked about maybe using Dylan Cease on short rest in game four and then bringing Darvish back for game five. So I thought to myself, okay, How's Dylan Cease done in his career on short rest? He's never pitched on short rest before. And I realize mm-hmm. the playoffs are different and you do different things in the playoffs. But I thought of this because of Emmanuel Classe. Emmanuel Classe gives up an extremely rare homer, right? We mentioned it earlier. 1,340 sliders thrown in the regular season of the playoffs in his career. Two homers allowed until number 1,341 was a homer to Kerry Carpenter that decided that game and gave the Tigers the game two win. 
I thought it was odd looking at the game logs and going back through Class A's season that he had one appearance that was more than a full inning, just one all year. And I think this is something we know teams are going to do in the postseason. We've seen enough of it in recent years to understand you want your best reliever out there and maybe finish the eighth and then go through the ninth. So you're asking for four or five or six outs. It seems like it would be very logical. We talked about this with the Tigers and how they mix and match pitchers and the benefits of it. If you are in a few different situations over the course of 162, I think that can make you more comfortable being in that situation in October. So I don't know how to quantify it, but I think if you're asking me today, would I want to start Dylan Cease on short rest? Maybe if it's an elimination game, right? If the, if the Dodgers win and they're up 2-1, maybe you do want to go to Cease in game four because that's your season on the line. Mm-hmm. But the Class A thing is like, hmm, you throw this guy out there 65, 70 times in the regular season and you only use them one time for more than three outs. That seems like an odd choice. And I'm not saying that's the reason why it didn't work out for him on Monday, but it's a usage thing that a lot of these elite relievers are the toggles are completely different. Even Hader, I think his usage for a long time in recent years has been straight up ninth inning. So you bring him in early and you ask for more and it breaks down. Maybe that's part of the reason why I don't, I don't know. It's just, just a theory. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there are some things that about this Kerry Carpenter in particular is like, do you know he was the sixth best hitter this year against um, right-handers? Just yeah, among all players, like that's among all players. It, it, and extreme, extreme in the sense that they platoon him. All the names ahead of him are like Aaron Judge, Bobby Witt Jr. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> phenomenal in that split. And so you'd never you you'd be like so. So they're you're gonna lead off Justin Henry Malloy, you know, uh, instead of just having Kerry Carpenter in your lineup. Maybe just put Kerry Carpenter like sixth in your lineup or something, you know, against the lefty. Well, like this is ridiculous, and there is a mathematical reason to suggest that Kerry Carpenter should not be as bad against lefties as he's been so far. Is that the observed platoon split, you know, for left-handers against left-handers? is about 10%. In other words, if you think that Kerry Carpenter is this good against righties, no matter what he's done against lefties in the past, he should be about as good as Anthony Santander against lefties in the future. So this he should be like 6th best against righties and then 25th best against lefties. You know what I mean? Like it should be... He should be able to handle it. He it, so far it hasn't been. It's been a huge split. He has he's been rolling over everything, and I I know that's why they do it. And so you're talking about comfort and rolls. Actually, uh, makes me feel a little better about platooning Kerry Carpenter at this point because that's what they've done all year. You know, and it would be a little bit weird maybe in the playoffs to be like, okay, Kerry, you're gonna get your third start against the lefty all year <laughs> you know, like have adam you know so uh and and then uh i guess the proof is in the results justin henry Malloy, two for three from the leadoff spot you know then gets taken out for carrie carpenter who hits the game running home run like aj hinch pushing all the right buttons again i guess well and with Justin Henry Malloy, it's like you got this really good small sample result against lefties in the regular season. A 250, 393, 500 line, right? That's how exactly many what you want. How many do you think that was? He wasn't even up on the roster 38. all season. <laughs> it um, actually 169 all right. against righties. All right. So a decent sample. Against but, righties or against lefties? Uh, uh, yeah, so my bad. Uh, 61 against lefties. Okay, 61. Yeah, and the thing is, like these are both small samples. The chances they gave him against righties, he was brutal, 188, 254, 325. I don't think you can definitively say he'll never hit righties. It's mm. just early career, seeing top-level pitching for the first time, trying to make some adjustments. I think the challenging part with Malloy in particular is they have not found a great defensive spot for him. So that's, that's- going to make him a tricky player to roster. Whereas Kerry Carpenter, I think, at least has passable defensive ability in the outfield where you can one day look at him and say, let's just see what happens in 2025. If we give him some more time against lefties, maybe he can solve lefties and be an everyday guy instead of just someone who's phenomenal against righties and has to share at has to share a spot. I mean, uh, we're picking the nits and it's kind of weird to pick these nits after Kerry Harper hit the homer, but I guess you could do something like um, Malloy 
starts the game at DH, um, and Kerry Carpenter starts in the outfield, and Wenseal Perez comes in. But you can't switch can't do that. someone to DH. No, nope, you would lose the DH if you did that. So Wenseal Perez would have to come in as DH. Yeah, it's it's, it's just not. It, it, it's hard to manage the roster this way. But this was a great pitching matchup overall. Scooble did Scooble things. The Guardians threatened a couple of times. And I think there was even a spot where John Kenzie Noel came up with uh, Josh Naylor on second base, one out in the fifth. It was a the spot we were hoping for, and Noel got hit by a pitch. So we didn't get to see if it would and, play and it out. Was, it was inside. I mean, that was that was the that was the zone we were looking for too. <laughs> yep, just a, just a little bit too far inside. Uh, I think that that rally that that possible opportunity ended with a Andres Jimenez double play. Uh, and Scooble had a couple of big double plays that got him out of some jams in the fifth and the sixth. There was a great catch Stephen Kwan made in the eighth that may have uh, may have been remembered a little more fondly if the Guardians had come had gone on to win this game. Uh, it was not overturned on review. I was watching that one a lot again this morning. Kind of like did that was there a bounce in there? Doesn't really matter. Turned I out, swear yeah. there's a there's leather thumb underneath it. It looks like it bounces because it does bounce on the ground, but I think there's leather underneath it. Is the is the thing, but. That's what it looks like on a few of the angles, but then when you watch the video, you see what looks like a tiny little hop from the ball as it's going into the glove. I don't know. Does it doesn't matter in the end because of the way this all this all played out. Um, but man, like if if you're looking at how this went wrong against Class A, it's like Jake Rogers 01 single, Trey Sweeney 10 single, and then the Carpenter Dinger off the slider. Like they had basically the best possible person up at the plate in that moment. I think even as much as we like Riley Green, we'd say Riley Green is our best all-around position player right now, best all-around hitter anyway. For the power and for the splits and what Carpenter had done, you couldn't have drawn that up any better if you're A.J. Hinch and the Tigers. And even the Tigers radio crew, I was listening to this game uh, with I was kind of toggling between home radio announcers for sound. They had that sort of vibe. They're like, well, it's never easy against Class A, but Kerry Carpenter is the perfect person for the situation. Yeah. You know, going forward, I do uh, wonder, you know, with all this, like, the games are really, really exciting, but you could also just sum it up and been like, well, you know, the Guardians won the Bybee start and the Tigers won the Scooble start. <laughs> Not exactly, exactly how we thought they would happen, but, you know, that's what happened. And I think this still favors the Guardians going forward because, you know, Alex Cobb is going out there for them. And I don't know that the Tigers can do Johnny Chaos whole staff for two games in a row, you know? Um, and so someone has to step forward. And like, when's the last time Reese Olsen pitched? Like, didn't Reese he... Olsen pitched in game one. So uh, he's not going to pitch until I wouldn't think he'd pitch until at least game five. So it's Cater Montero. I think you'd see Cater Montero, and then more likely the in Game Four than in Game Three. But Game Three is probably not impossible. So who is it? Well, you're going to get some Holton out there again, probably Herder. So it's going to be Herder. So maybe you wouldn't start with Holton because Herder is lefty. Hmm. So maybe you open with Bo Brisky. You can the open with Bo Brisky. He, yeah. He, the day after he closed. <laughs> can I have the Bo Brisky playoff saves on my on my uh, draft and holds? Can I get those, please? <laughs> or maybe you open with Foley. Right, because Foley didn't pitch in two. And you don't want to use Bo Brisky. Herder didn't pitch in two. You don't want to use Bo Brisky in two straight games unless you're winning. So you could use Foley at the beginning. And if you lose, you hold Bo Brisky for the next game. And if you win, if you're winning, you Bo Brisky is going to save. Okay, I'm on board with that. I mean, Alex Cobb. Like, what, what is what is the realistic expectation for Alex Cobb in Game Three? Like, the, the Guardians have been very quick to go to the pen each of the first two games, even with Bybee starting in Game One. It was actually the, the same script, right? I think it was uh, John Kenzie Noel threw out Malloy at second. But Malloy would have been on with the top of the order coming around again, exactly as Parker Meadows got on to knock out Bybee the third time through the order. And that's when they went to the pen. They followed the exact same script. So I can't imagine we'd see Alex Cobb 
any longer than we saw Matthew Boyd, barring the they have a massive lead and they want to just keep everybody a little more fresh for game four. At, at the first sign of trouble, you're going to turn it over to what's been the league's best bullpen this year. And that's what Stephen Vogt continues to do. Yeah, I I still I really like Alex Cobb. And you know, there there is a version of him that is actually pretty effective and efficient in terms of the sinker can get some ground ball outs and he can kind of he can move through teams pretty quickly if he wants to. So I mean if if everything's feeling good and I think there's a blister and you know, different injuries he's dealt with. So I don't I'm not assuming that he's gonna feel great. Um we did hear that, um, you know, I've heard from multiple sources that it's pretty commonplace to um, to get a shot of Toradol, which is like um, the, a very powerful non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory uh, right before the playoffs, and it lasts about four weeks. So, um, you know, that might have something to do with the, the playoff velo bump <laughs> and like maybe – Maybe Cobber's feeling good right now. So, um, oh, but adrenaline uh, is just such a better way to describe it. It's just adrenaline. It could be yeah, both. It could, I mean, it could be the combo of adrenaline and getting an anti-inflammatory injection. Uh, but either way, uh, uh, you know, if Cobb is feeling good, like he can kind of, I think he can go four. I think he can go four or five. Um, and I think they they want him to go four because, you know as good as this bullpen is i'm i do think there are some stars in it where it's kate smith and class a and then there's a little bit of a kind of a, a step down to like the hunter gaddis um you know kind of crew below that so um if you could draw it up you might want to just pitch cobb smith and class a tonight and that way if you did that you'd feel like that's 100 percent a guardians win i mean that's huge if you can cut it down to that much but i think the smith heron gaddis class a quartet is the way they've mapped mm -hmm. it out in these first couple of games so that's sort of what i expect anytime a starter goes short they go a little shorter than that they go maybe one reliever deeper if they have to just to kind of make the pieces fit that should at some point open up something for the tigers you know if, if Cobb goes three there's got to be something something there for the tigers you'd think right Let's take a look at the other series going down right now. The Royals took game two in the Bronx from the Yankees. My concerns about the matchup were possibly the long ball, especially with the start being in Yankee Stadium where Carlos Rodon's had some struggles with homers. It was just a Sal Perez solo shot as far as homers that were allowed, but that sort of started the big inning that pushed Carlos Rodon out of this game. In fact, he looked really good the first time through the order. Something about this one is a head scratcher to me, right? It's it's Yuli Gurriel and Tommy Pham scratching out the second run. Garrett Hampson coming in to drive in Pham. What do you think? Uh, Garrett, Garrett Hampson that I wouldn't have on my playoff roster. I have, if, uh, maybe maybe as a speed, maybe as that like Darian Blanco, like you know, pinch runner type. That would be about it. I mean, what is Garrett Hampson's career WRC plus? You know, seventy three. You're very close. It's sixty nine. Wow, that is not nice. That is not nice at all. It's not a playoff roster player. And yet there he is driving in a run and playing a role because that's well, I, how I, you know, I had this, goes. I have this thing for Carlos Rodon, which is this is what Carlos Rodon's pitches look like from behind home plate, um, you know, thanks to a, a baseball savant uh, tool. And I think, first of all, you know, I see a lot of those red four seamers that are in the chase uh, and that are not even in the chase zone. They're in the waste zone above the the, the strike zone. Yeah, and then generally you see a really clear pattern of the four seam being high and the slider being low. Um, and uh, if there is anything that's middle of the zone, it's slider. And so if you are a hitter that wants to, you know, sit on something you know, in the middle of the zone, you can sit on something that's, you know, high 80s in the middle of zone, you sit on the slider. And we saw plenty of hits off the slider, especially in that second or third time through the order, where uh, the second time through the order, where Carlos Rodon was throwing like five sliders out of six pitches to some uh, hitters. So if you start to see, oh, the guy before me just got five sliders and six pitchers, I'm going to sit slider. And uh, some of those biggest hits, the Hampson hit, um, I think one of the fam hits, like I think three out of those hits in that inning were off the slider. Definitely Sal Perez 
hit a middle middle slider a long way. And that might be what I see when I see this kind of a spray chart as a hitter. I see, well, it's really easy kind of to identify the four seam is going to be up, the slider is going to be down. And if there's anything that's going to be middle middle, it's probably going to be the slider. So maybe that's what I'll sit. Um, and as for, you know, some of the emotional back and forth, uh, it's pretty clear that Carlos Rodon is a better pitcher when he's emotional and when he's hooing and hawing and getting all sweaty and, and yelling. So I don't begrudge him that at all. And uh, it is kind of funny for Michael Garcia to come back and be like, well, you know, you celebrated a little bit too early, guy. Uh, you do open yourself up for that if you're if you're going to be, you know, like that on the mound. But uh, kudos to the, the Royals for, for having a good attack game plan against Rodon. Um, and I think this might be a little bit of why Rodon has um, sometimes some trouble um, as the game goes deeper is that I think he does become a little bit um, – predictable in terms of where he puts his pitches so if i were him i would throw some low fastball sometimes throw put some doubt in their mind especially the second time through the order where they think oh my god he's going really heavy slider right now oh what if you throw a low fastball if you throw a low fastball the time that garrett hampson got the hit on the low slider i think he would have blown it past him yeah, it does look a little predictable seeing it mapped out the way that you had it. And you wonder if that's a part of how the Royals were able to scratch out those runs and it would turn out to be the huge inning that they needed, getting all four of their runs in that one frame. Uh, Cole Reagan's only went four in this one. If you told me going in, Reagan was only going four, I would have said, oh, okay, then the Royals probably didn't find a way to win this game. It took him 87 pitches to get that far. I think even in that fourth inning, Sal Perez, during one of the sequences, ran out towards the mound for a mound visit and was trying to signal the dugout to get somebody up because nobody was up throwing at that time. The bold decision was going back to Angel Zerpa in the fifth, and it worked out fine this time. Be that for the reason you mentioned earlier, maybe the lack of familiarity with him, but Zerpa and John Schreiber continue to be the two guys that when you see them in the middle innings, those have to be the two relievers that Royals fans are the most nervous about out there. I mean, I think Chris Bubich to some extent because, you know, I know he's had some good numbers and that there have been plenty of, you know, mediocre starters that have made great relievers. Um, but Bubich did, has not gotten the velo bump that you'd expect, you know, going to the pen. And he allowed four hard hit balls in two innings. And I, you know, I just think that whole Zerpa Schreider, Schreiber Bubich connection is, is a little suspect for me. And I, I I can't help but circle that as like, hey, that's when the Yankees lost the game, really. Because, you know, a four to one deficit should not be, you know, unassailable for an offense like this. And you let Zerba, Schreiber, and Bubich throw four zeros on you. Um, I think that's that's where they they, they really lost out. Because they, they made some noise against Urseg. And um Urseg himself is is a good closer, but I don't know that I'd put him, you know, in the level of Class A and Williams and all them. So um, if you had put one or two runs against Zerba, Schreiber, and Bubich and then got to Urseg, then you could have tied the game. I mean, that's that's to me where I, I circle. And then I, on the other hand, I, I also circle the, the Yankees pen um, for two things. One, they pitched really well. You know, they pitched really well, and they – a lot of them got out there and Ian Hamilton, three strikeouts and four outs. Um, you know, Clay Holmes, another clean inning. Uh, Tommy Conley was good. Luke Weaver was, you know, had to come in and clean some stuff up. But um, the other thing that I circle about this is they all pitched. So, you know, to some extent, you if you're going to ride them this hard, you know, maybe they're going to open themselves up for, uh, possible uh, situation in the bullpen too. So, um, you know, series is tied. <laughs> I still think the Yankees are going to win this one, but a big part of this is them finally breaking in uh, against that bullpen. Well, it's going to be Seth Lugo against Clark Schmidt as the pitching matchup for game three on Wednesday. I'm curious who you like better in that particular spot with this game being played in Kansas City. Yeah, I mean, I, I like Seth Lugo better. Just a, a nice wide arsenal. He can keep everybody off kilter. Um, you never know, though, that like this this sort of 
playoff analytics born trend of, of taking guys out early if Lugo's dealing through four but they feel like oh it's third time through the order we need to get in the bullpen we've already seen um the Royals make a decision like this with other pitchers in the past that might go against them where they go back to the well with Zerba Schreider and Brubich and this time the the Yankees hitters have just recently seen them and and, and b- blow the game open against those guys yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about you know part of the the pattern that they used even in the Lugo game last week against the Orioles. It was pretty similar to what they've been doing, where it was Zerpa coming in once again in the fifth, Shriver behind Zerpa. They squeezed Sam Long in there for a couple of outs, Bubich for one instead of two, and then Ursig to finish it off. And I think that's the that's their A bullpen, the the depth version of their A bullpen right now. I think that's still something they would really prefer to get away from. But I guess the the choice comes down to this. Would you rather let Lugo go through a third time or use some combination of Zerpa, Schreiber, and Long against the Yankees order? Maybe it depends on where you're at in the order at the time, like in in what the situation is and how you get there. Like if you have a clean inning for Lugo to come in the third time through, maybe you let him go one batter at a time and, and just make that decision. If someone reaches, pull it then. But that's the tough choice that I think you're making on a night to night basis. And it seems like they favor their relievers right now over their starters the third time. Yeah. And I guess the analytics are going to say, yes, you should do that. Um, because you, you know, the analytics aren't like what has, uh, you know, Seth Lugo done, you know, it's what have all pitchers done uh, third time through the order. Is that right? Is that the way you should do it, though? I mean, because you think about the differences between Lugo and someone maybe that's like a fastball slider, 90% two-pitch guy. There's a huge difference in what you're expecting as a hitter from those kinds of pitchers. Where Lugo's got more wrinkles he can throw at you. Darvish has more wrinkles he can throw at you. So I I, I don't think that the perfectly straightforward, rigid decision makes sense to me. I think what the pitcher has in terms of depth and quality of arsenal is an important variable to consider. Yeah. Yeah. And we do know that there is research that suggests that every additional pitch you have softens your third time through the order penalty. I don't know if that goes all the way to nine though. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe, maybe at four or five, then you've already sort of like plateaued in terms of the benefits. If you, uh, if you have nine pitches, that means you have a reverse uh, third time through the order split. Uh, what you have seen from Lugo is 696 OPS first time through, 689 second time through, 741 third time through, um, 741 OPS allowed, and uh, what you've seen from um, you know somebody like uh, Angel Zerpa is that you know for the season before the season he was projected to have a four three to four six era um and i would venture that'd be very close to a 741 ops now of course he's had a little bit better season than he was projected to but in terms of strikeouts minus walks in fact his season was just about dead on i mean everyone's projecting him for sort of 19 to 20 percent strikeout rate he had a 20.5 everyone's projecting him for a seven to eight walk rate he had a 7.9 so in terms of K minus BB, he kind of was who he was projected to be. So I think that line is probably closer than it is in a lot of other places. I mean, you're not bringing in Ian Hamilton. You're bringing in Angel Zerpa. You know, like I, I think Ian Hamilton's a better pitcher. I think, you know, I think it may actually make sense if you drilled all the way down, you did all the projections that you might actually find you want Seth Lugo a third time through over Angel Zerpa. Well, they didn't want to call Reagan's in that spot. And the pitch count was up over 80 at the time. But Reagan's has five different pitches. So it's it's not like he's a, a two-pitch guy. And they they went to Zerpa instead. It feels risky. I don't know how many times the Royals can get away with that. I also don't expect Bobby Witt Jr. to uh, remain hitless through the entire series. So to just come out of the Bronx with a split and not have anything from Witt yet, you know, that'll probably change at some point. In the remaining games, I mean, Judge is hitting 143 in the postseason, so they both have, yeah, uh, you know, they both have guys on on each side that um, you know are looking to break out. Stanton uh, is hitting 125, and of course, he had three rockets last night. But the legs, they do not look like rockets. They no, look like 
whatever the opposite of rockets are uh anchors (laughs) yes that's at the opposite jazz had a nice big homer and there's a chance that he becomes uh uh, you know i could see him if they win the series or they win a series going down you know further i could see him winning a a series mvp um because there's going to be you know traffic on the bases for him no matter what happens ahead of him um He's an exciting player who's changed a little bit this year with the Yankees than what he was before. He's pulling the ball more. And I I asked him, is that because, uh, you know, that porch out there? And he said, A, no. Uh, B, I'm with James Rosen, my my hitting coordinator, my hitting uh, coach, when I used to uh, pull the ball more in 2022 and I had my best season. And the third thing is uh, when you're in, when you come to a place like this, he said, when you come to New York, you don't want to be on the bottom of that list. Like when you come in here and you see Judge and you see Soto, you don't want to be on the bottom of that list. So um, it, I think it does speak to him playing up to the limelight and playing up to the to the moment. Uh, that seems to be the kind of personality he is. So um, even if uh, Judge doesn't break out, you know, you could have a Soto Jazz pairing. Soto gets on base, Jazz hits him uh, in with a homer. And uh, that's how they win. But Clark Schmidt is a is a is a, a little bit of a, a Michael Kingian pitcher. When he's right, he does a lot of the Michael King things, where he dominates righties with swinker sweeper, and he just gets by lefties. His changeup is not as good as Michael King's, and so I would circle some lefties in this lineup. But who am I circling? MJ Melendez. I, Who's the best lefty in this lineup? I, Massey, probably. Oh, well, Vinny Vasquitino is the best lefty when he's completely yeah. healthy. It, yeah. It's only it's only even a question because of his thumb, right? Yeah. He would so be Vasquitino, Massey, lefty. and Melendez, like they need something out of those guys against Clark Schmidt. Um, otherwise, they're going to go up against the same bullpen that, that that hung a bunch of zeros on them and is actually uh, what I think one of the most underrated bullpens in the postseason. I think this is going to be a spot where uh, Bobby Witt Jr. is going to homer off of a Clark Schmidt sweeper that misses i think that's mm-hmm. that's gonna happen i think he's gonna try and get down and away chases he's gonna miss one and wit's gonna hit it a long way let's get that home crowd i mean he's you know young guy the home crowd might be might be a, a nice uh a solve for the the, the postseason woes so far it's coming. I'm excited for it, though. I mean, all these series not up at one, so plenty of drama to follow here in the next few days. We are going to go. Dodgers, reminder, Dodgers is going to be a zoo tonight. It's going to be stupid. It's going to be crazy. It's so dumb. <laughs> Get a subscription to The Athletic at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. $2 a month gets you in the door. Find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. Find me at Derek Riper. Find the pod at rates and barrels. We are back with you on Wednesday. Thanks for listening.